So in this video, we're going to take a look at magnetic fields and looking at describing different types of fields. And then we'll take a look at how we actually turn something into a magnet in the first place. So let's start off with some magnetic fields. Uh, so if we use iron filings with a bar magnet, we can see something that looks like this diagram over here on the right hand side. But what I'm going to show you is how we would actually sketch a diagram to show this, because we're not going to draw all of those lines and things that you can see there. So what we do is obviously we've got our magnet, we've got our north and south poles, and we will start drawing field lines. And the field lines go from north all the way to the south pole, and we'll keep drawing them a little bit like this. So this would be a diagrammatic representation of the picture you can see over there. And there's a few key things that you should need to make sure you're showing on a diagram. So there should be no incomplete field line. So if a field line leaves the North Pole, it must reach a South Pole. You can't have incomplete lines, that's not possible. Second, we'd expect the further away from the magnet you get, the spacing between lines would increase, showing the field is getting weaker, essentially. We should never see field lines crossing over, so they might get very close together, but they'll never cross over one another. They should never really touch each other. I'm not sure I've done the best job of showing that at the North Pole anyway, but they should never touch and they should never cross over. And finally, the thing you'll see there's arrows on the field lines. Those lines should point from north to south. That shows us the direction of the field line. So that's our representation of a bar magnet's magnetic field. Okay, so now we're going to look, start looking at how we show the fields once we have two magnets actually interacting with each other. So what you're seeing on the diagram here is essentially two bar magnets and they're set up to attract one another. So let's see how we would represent this. So here we have two magnets that are attracting each other because we've got the North Pole pointing to a South Pole. And so we would draw a field a little bit like this. So some of these field lines, which were originally going from the North Pole to the South Pole on the same magnet, now will take the shorter distance to this South Pole over here. So we get a region of dense field lines over here, just like you can see on the real diagram with iron filings there. So that's essentially how we'd represent that. We create this region of quite high, dense field lines over here. What if they are repelling? Well, you'll see on the diagram here, we create this region with pretty much nothing in between them. So let's actually see how we represent that. So I've done it with a North Pole and a North Pole. I could equally have done this with a South Pole and a South Pole. But essentially what they do is they push each other's fields away. So that's what's creating this region with no field lines in the middle. Because essentially the field lines that were there have been pushed away so they're no longer in that one. And that's how we're getting the repulsion. It's these field lines pushing each other apart essentially. Okay, so this is our repelling magnetic field. We would have done exactly the same thing if we had the South Pole pointing at each other, but we need to make sure we're showing the field lines going from North Pole to South Pole, but otherwise it'd be the same. Okay, so now let's look at how we actually turn something into a magnet and the way we visually represent that using something called the magnetic domains or domains from short. Um, so we, you can see some of these domains represented on these diagrams. So this one on the left, you can see we've got these arrows. And so what we're basically thinking of is a material as made of lots of mini magnets. So imagine a material is made of loads of mini magnets, but these magnets are all pointing in different directions, so they cancel each other out. So these arrows you can see here point from the north pole of the mini magnet to the south pole. That's what they're showing. So on the left, we've got an unmagnetized material because they're all pointing in different directions. On the right hand side, we've got a magnetized material because a lot of them have been lined up. There is still the odd one that's pointing in the opposite direction. Um, so you've got like here and here, for example, but most of them are lined up. So this would um, have its own magnetic field. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. OK, so. Before we can start describing and looking at that, we need to define some terms we're going to be using with magnetism and electromagnetism and things like that. So the first thing is what we mean by a magnetic field. So the first thing to look at is what is actually creating a magnetic field. 
So magnetic fields are produced around moving charged particles. So if a charged particle is stationary, it doesn't have a magnetic field. It only has one if it's moving. And you'll need to learn a lot more about relativity before we can actually explain why that is. So that's the first thing. They're created by moving charged particles. And if another moving charged particle enters that region, it will experience a magnetic force. So you only get magnetic forces between things that both have moving charged particles. You, fundamentally with materials, that's the electrons that are in the material, um, but that's what's creating and experiencing magnetic fields and forces respectively. Next, we have something called what we call a dipole. So this is at a really small level. So when we're talking about a particle, so this is a particle that's producing a magnetic field because it's moving and it's charged. And the magnetic field lines start and end at the same object. So they're not going to another object. So thinking of an electron, the field line comes out of the electron and goes back into the electron, for example. But we don't really talk about dipoles much at this stage of the course. We're going to look at the next level up in terms of size. We're going to look at domains. So a domain is just a collection of dipoles that are all oriented in the same direction and move together. So we don't really need to think about dipoles. We can just think at the level up at a domain. Think of it kind of like electricity where we talk about electrons and then we talk about coulombs, which is a large number of electrons that we think of uh, moving together. It's the same idea here between a dipole and a domain. It's just a large collection of dipoles that all do the same thing. Okay, so um, a magnetic material is a material with domains. So a lot of materials, I'd say most materials, do not have domains. They don't have dipoles that, or they don't have dipoles that move together. So that covers most materials. Most of them are non-magnetic, but some materials have these domains, um, which means they can then be magnetized. So turning a magnetic material into an actual magnet uh, by aligning its domains is called magnetization. Hopefully, fairly logical. And there's a, a term that we will come across, the idea of a saturated magnet. So when all the domains in a material have been aligned, uh, that will produce the strongest possible magnetic field for that material overall. So that's called a saturated magnet, and we wouldn't be able to make it any stronger. If we come back to our diagram that I showed you earlier, so the left... The material on the left, it would be called a magnetic material because it's got these domains. Um, and on the right, we've turned it into a magnet because we've st started aligning those domains. So their fields are all pointing in the same direction and therefore their fields will add together and produce a really strong magnetic field. And the more fields that are aligned, the stronger the overall magnetic field will be. So the more of these domains we can get lined up, the stronger the field we're going to get. Okay. How do we go about magnetizing a material or turning a magnetic material into a magnet? Well, the first and simplest way is you take a permanent magnet that you've already made and you essentially slowly stroke the material with the permanent magnet, ensuring the strokes are in one direction or only. So you can see on this diagram here, essentially we're going to use the north pole and we're going to stroke from the left end to the right end and we're going to keep doing that and that will eventually turn the steel bar into a magnet essentially so steel is a magnetic material um, it's actually quite hard to magnetize steel but if you do this enough it will work um, but that's a method of turning it into a magnet now some uh, slightly faster and less human intensive ways Okay, so a second way we can turn a magnetic material into a magnet is using a coil with a current flowing through it, and it's specifically a DC current. So what does that look like? So if we plot a graph, or I give a quick sketch of current versus time, a DC current will look like this. So it'll be the same value the whole time. Okay, so let's just add that on. Okay, so that's what we mean by DC current. So we'd need a reasonably large current because uh, that current is going to be producing a magnetic field and that's what's going to be causing this material to magnetize. 
Okay, so that's the second way. The final way we can turn a magnetic material into a magnet is um, quite basic, um, but this works as well. So you can hammer it, and that does literally mean getting out a hammer and hitting it. So we take the material, we put it inside another magnetic field, and then we hammer it, which essentially allows the domains to move and line themselves up with the other magnetic field. Uh, so fairly simple, but that does work as well. So those are our three methods for magnetization. So now we can look at the exact opposite. How do we demagnetize a material? So one way we can do that is by heating it, because that allows the domains to reposition and become disaligned with one another. And the temperature at which that happens is known as the Curie temperature. The second way we can do it is again getting out our hammer. So this time we're doing it not in a magnetic field. So we just take the magnet and literally hammer it. Um, dropping it on the floor has a very similar effect. And again, it allows the domains to reposition and become disaligned. They become randomly scrambled. Final thing you can do is using an electromagnet again, but this time we have a coil carrying an AC current. So again, like before, I'll just give you a quick sketch what that means. So if we have current versus time, typically an alternating current would look like this. So its value and its direction is constantly changing. So if we slowly remove our magnet from a coil of that, essentially it will be lining up the domains in all different directions and you've got demagnetized. Okay, so the final thing um, I actually didn't put a section for in your booklets, which I really should have, is looking at why soft magnetic materials like iron are always attracted to magnets and what happens if you use a hard magnetic material like steel. So if you want to turn to additional notes section or something like that, we can um, put this in. So I'm going to do this mostly using diagrams so you can see what's happening. So we've got a permanent magnet over here on the left and we've got a soft magnetic material, maybe iron over here on the right. What we're going to do is we're going to bring the magnet closer to it. So the thing to notice is that the domains closest to the magnet have started to align with the magnetic field. And we can do the same thing. If we bring it even closer, these other domains are going to line up as well. And remember, the domain arrow points from north to south. So that's going to be a, now become a south pole at this end, a north pole at that end. So they attract each other. So that's if we bring a north pole of a permanent magnet close to it. So what we've seen there, soft magnet material is attracted to a north pole. Let's south pole. So again, as we bring the magnet closer, we can see the domains are starting to align. And when we get really close, we can see they're all now lined up like this. And we can see that we've got our domains pointing from north to south. So that's going to be north, that's going to be south. and then it's going to attract. So a soft magnetic material is always attracted to a permanent magnet. doesn't matter which pole we approach it with. Let's have happens with a hard magnetic material. So the key thing to notice is that the hard magnetic material, the domains don't change because it takes a lot of work to change their alignment. So that's the thing. So this permanent magnet has absolutely no effect on the hard magnetic material at all, or barely any effect. So it hasn't become magnetized, it doesn't attract, it does nothing. What if the hard magnetic material was already magnetized? So you can see here, we've got it already magnetized, like you can see here. So again, there is no change in, or very little change in domain alignment. As we bring the magnet closer, we would need to be doing something like hammering or heating to allow them to move. So again, there is no change. So if we bring the south pole towards it in this case, you can see that it will attract it because we've got opposite poles. But we flip it round. So now our hard magnet material is aligned the other way. Again, there's no change in domain alignment as we bring the magnet closer. But this time we've got two south poles pointing at each other and those two are going to repel. So soft magnet materials are always attracted to a permanent magnet. Unmagnetized hard materials do nothing with a permanent magnet. 
And magnetized hard magnetic materials can either attract or repel depending on which way round you put them. So they act like other permanent magnets, essentially. Okay, so just to clarify what we mean by some of the terminology we've been using. So when we say soft magnetic material, we mean a material where only a small amount of work is required to move the domains, which makes them ideal for use in electromagnets, which we're going to talk about in the next video. A hard magnetic material requires a large amount of work to move the domains. That's why they don't respond as you bring a magnet towards them, unless you're hammering them or heating them or something like that. 